Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, it's great to, to come to an event like this. Uh, uh, as I previously said to, to some of you, um, I love it when there's an event where you can reach across the boundaries, the boundaries of disciplines. I think the railway works better when we work uh, across disciplines and, and make sure that we see it from uh, each other's perspective. Uh, so if I do get bogged down in the language of our trains and your track, please know that it comes from a, a, a place of love and uh, charity and <laughs> <coughs> respect and harmony. Uh, I'll, I'll skirt through this because we, we are running a little bit late. Uh, I'll just go through a few of the... Um, oh, we're running okay? Oh, I'm told we're running okay. Right. I'm going to be here for a long time. Um, <laughs> I'll just summarise a few things about the, uh, the damage at the wheel rail interface, those that we know uh, and that we're aware of. Uh, a little bit of, of a dip into what uh, colleagues here have, have done within Network Rail to try and incentivize OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, to do better in their, in their making their vehicles more track friendly, um, uh, and how that's impacted really in the technologies that we're now seeing coming to the fore with uh, all the, the new fleets that are being deployed, deployed on our rails in this country. Uh, we'll have a little look at, at what future technologies might emerge in this area as well. Uh, and then a sort of a bit of a state of the nation. Where are we at right now? And, and looking down the pike at how what, what's happening now might affect us uh, both as rolling stock and as, as track and permanent way engineers in the future. So uh, apologies if I'm teaching people what they already know. It's just a, a useful recap here. And if I'm using terminology that, that, uh, that, that people are unfamiliar with, then please just catch me afterwards and I'll try and explain it in the best way that I can. Uh, so the, the primary uh, bits of, of, of track damage really come from, um, uh, we, well, we've already talked in, in a number of sessions today about rolling contact fatigue. Uh, that's generally seen to, to emanate from primary yaw stiffness, the ability of, of a vehicle to actually uh, turn its wheel sets on its bogies uh, and be compliant to uh, the, the track curvature. Vertical fractures are generally uh, thought to come from, uh, as well as point loads, so P over D values, um, the P2 force that's generated by a vehicle, um, and that is, is in principle uh, generated in turn by uh, speed and the unsprung mass of, of the uh, equipment in the bogey. So there's been a lot of uh, work, probably from about 1963, 64 onwards, in trying to reduce unsprung mass as we've uh, increased the speed of vehicles in the UK. Uh, gauge side wear and track spreading, flange contact uh, due to and, and, uh, and, and long and stiff wheelbases. Of course, we all in the northwest know of uh, vehicles that have got stiff, long wheelbases that are hopefully going to be uh, eradicated fairly soon. Um, and top wear is, is uh, induced by poor curving ability. So that's generally speaking uh, the, the inability of bogies to, to find the, the correct equilibrium of, of their um, conicity uh, on a particular curve uh, feature. And then general wear and tear. Um, so it's inevitable that we send a certain amount of tons over a particular piece of track that we're going to have to go in and uh, replace the rails, grind the ra rails, reballast, tamp it, whatever we have to do to sustain uh, and maintain that piece of track. Uh, there's an association just purely with, with the absolute amount of, of tonnage that's passing over. So uh, I heard the name Mark Burstow uh, spoken uh, in an earlier lecture, and I think. Uh, that Mark uh, had some involvement in some of this work. He certainly has more recently. Uh, this, I think, was the first train infrastructure interface specification uh, that was used for the IEP procurement back in 2007. Yes, it is that long ago. Um, and uh, this basically set out, alongside the train technical specification, a whole bunch of interface requirements that Network Rail wanted to see the, the train manufacturers adhering to. Um, and in it, mainly, uh, from a, the wheel rail interface point of view, um, it was looking at trying to reduce T gamma values. Uh, again, Paul mentioned that, that terminology. That's, that's a, a specific characteristic of the train uh, that it generates a, a contact patch energy uh, given uh, the, the suspension characteristics. And the higher the energy, uh, the worse that can be in terms of, of, of uh, propagating fatigue cracks in the, the rail surface. Uh, so there's quite a, a set of complex uh, uh, requirements around that. Uh, and then in conjunction with some of the requirements in GMT T0088, which I hope a number of you are familiar with, um, again, that's to do with mainly point loading and uh, PT loads and, and lateral loading. Um, the, the 
main core procurements of rolling stock over the last few years have combined those two to hopefully bring us a new generation of trains, uh, certainly different from the trains that were procured in the 1970s and 1980s, and that includes IEP, Thameslink, Crossrail. Uh, we've incorporated actually the, the TIS requirements into the overall train technical specification, so they form part of a homogenous spec for the HS2 uh, tender, which is, is currently being evaluated. Uh, and again, we, it's interesting to sort of see some of the tender as responses uh, to those requirements. So where has that led us? Um, you will see if you're a train spotter or just vaguely interested in trains, so you don't have to stand on the end of Doncaster platform with a notebook in your hand um, to take a, a professional interest in some of these things, but you'll see new trains that have these kind of bogies, inside frame bogies where the wheels are actually on display. Um, uh, this was kind of pioneered by Bombardier in this country. They bought an old British Railways design at privatization and, and uh, made it into the B5000 or B5005 bogey. That actually has op been operating for the last 20 years on the Voyagers that you sometimes see in Piccadilly um, that uh, operate on cross country and uh, the, the Meridians that, that run on the Midland Main Line that service my, my own journeys down to London. Um, and uh, it's it's really quite a step forward in terms of mass saving uh, because obviously you, you shave off bits of steel on the bogies, on the, um, the wheel sets, uh, but also by bringing the frames inside as well, you, you save a lot of metal on the, the transoms and some of the longitudinal members. Um, so it was used initially on the, the, um, uh, the Meridians and the, the Voyagers and it kept the track access charges down, uh, which the operators liked. Uh, it's been started to be used on the turbostars, but now it's really being used with a bang on the Aventra because Bombardier found a way of putting traction motors inside the, the inside frames because there's not a lot of space once you move those frames inboard. And we've also seen it now on, on some of the other platforms that are coming in. So the city train that, that Siemens have provided for Thameslink services, that has inside frame bogies. Uh, the Civity units that are starting to, to appear in, in Manchester and, and the Northwest uh, that Northern have purchased. Um, they use inside frame burgers, that's a calf design, and Stadler have done it as well for their Merseyrail stock that's just being moved up to, uh, to Liverpool uh, and will soon enter service um, uh, on that franchise. Uh, and Hitachi have developed one as well for the IEP, uh, they've only developed a trailer one and I'm not sure that they've actually captured all of the benefits of the inside frame configuration, but, but it's still there, it's still an attempt to reduce mass, reduce primary sprung mass. Um, uh, and, and therefore trying to keep the, the, uh, the track-friendly nature of vehicles, uh, especially when actually we, we seem to be increasing the mass above the bogies, which doesn't kind of make sense really, but anyway. Uh, so we, we're achieving a kind of neutral mass uh, of, of vehicles with the, the uh, proliferation of systems outside of the bogey uh, by saving weight on the bogey. Now, one of the things you may hear talked about, which one's the laser? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. Brilliant. Excellent. So um, you may have heard about Hall Bushes. You may not have done. It's quite a, a niche project that's been going on in the railway industry. But uh, we talked about primary yaw stiffness as being a driver of, of rolling contact fatigue. Um, so I've put a bogey up here just to illustrate. This is a radial arm suspension bogey. So there's, there's a, a, an axle box there that prescribes a radius from, from this point here on the bogey out to the axle box here. Um, there is a, quite a stiff rubber bush there that connects the two and uh, that generally determines the primary yaw stiffness on, in that kind of configuration. I'm aware that there are other bogey frames that don't have the radius arm, um, but uh, even on the inside frame bogies there's a traction link from the bogey to the axle box which does a similar sort of thing. So it is being used in, in, uh, in, in those designs as well. So this bush, as I say, determines the primary yaw stiffness. Um, what you want, basically, is a, uh, on, on a curvy track, you want a low primary yaw stiffness so that the bogey is, is more pliable and can, can uh, curve without causing too much damage. Uh, but then when you want it to go in a straight line and you're going quite quickly, you want the primary yaw stiffness to be a bit, bit stiffer. Um, you want a higher value so that you don't start uh, reducing the critical speed of the bogey and you get hunting and oscillation. And anybody who's travelled on Class 395s out of St Pancras down to the southeast may have experienced that in the past few years. It actually say they've got a solution to the problem now. I'm sure that they have, but it's taken them a long time to get there, and it's been a cause of some consternation to uh, both network rail high speed and to uh, uh, southeastern. 
So uh, we want the best of both worlds, really. And what the hall bush does is, uh, this is the, the bush in question. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of metal, and the, this element here is, is rubber. Um, and what they've done is to core out a couple of cavities here. Uh, and there's, there's a, a small channel in between the two. Uh, and there's hydraulic media in there. And that means that in low frequency um, vi uh, uh, oscillations, uh, that hydraulic fluid passes from one channel to the other quite quickly, quite nicely. Um, so that means that in your 2,000 metre, 1,500 metre radius curves, you've got a low primary yaw stiffness. But at high frequencies, when it starts to hunt, and it wants to sort of move from one side to the other, sorry, um, uh, it locks up. That, that hydraulic media becomes a, a lot stiffer, and it doesn't pass through the, the channel so much. So it actually increases the stiffness, and it means you've got more stability in a straight line. It's been used on the Mark IVs on, on the East Coast in, in trials. Uh, it's now starting to appear in other production vehicles as well, uh, and hopefully we'll see the benefits of that in, in terms of, of, again, stability at high speed, but compliance at low speed. Um, we're starting to see uh, some technologies of the future being proposed. Um, we've been talking about composites in railway vehicles forever. Uh, some people have actually done some composite body shells in the past. Um, I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a stage, unless the price really comes down significantly, where we'll have composite body shells. We might have some elements of it. Um, but, but composite bogey frames is an interesting one, because once you start to get to a point where the bogey frame is stiff enough to uh, endure proof, proof and fatigue loading, uh, but pliable enough to, to not lead as, as many suspension elements, you can start reducing primary sprung mass even more than we have done already with some of the inside bogey frame designs. And I think that could become a real whole life cost driver that pushes us towards uh, composite bogey frames. So even though it looks like a little bit of a Lego kit there, uh, that is actually a, a full scale <laughs> bogey frame that's been built um, with uh, side frames there out of, of composites. Um, it still has, there's still question marks over the maintainability and the cost of such an uh, uh, item, but I, I think in the future, next 10 years, say, we, we might start to see some production versions of that. Mechatronics are already starting to make an impact on, uh, on bogey designs and suspension elements. Um, so we've, we've already got some, some uses in the world of primary um, dampers and primary springs that, that have variable rates. Um, we could put actuators in places of bushes, and on the ETR 1000 in Italy, uh, on the uh, Freccia Rossa, uh, that, that vehicle has uh, mechatronic uh, actuators in the, uh, the, the uh, radial arm pivot bushes that again give it that variability of, of primary yaw stiffness. Uh, obviously, there's inherent costs and uh, maintenance uh, issues in, involved with that, but as the technology becomes simpler, uh, more easy to procure, uh, and more reliable, I think you'll see a lot more of that. Uh, and I believe that somebody's already presented on, sorry, somebody's already presented on this earlier. This is a, 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 an experimental rig that's on the Via Rail uh, prototypes, um, where you've got independent wheels that are steering and, and being motored uh, independent of each other. Uh, again, that could be an interesting development. Um, be interesting to see structurally how that all works. Um, but again, it, it will allow us to have a more active steering capability uh, and, and again reduce those uh, creep forces that are happening at the contact patch uh, in time to come. So it's brilliant. We've got a lot of new trains being commissioned onto the railway. Uh, obviously, they're not happening as quickly as, as we'd hoped them to be, but particularly in the northwest and in the north of England, uh, there are a lot of new trains uh, that we'll see over the, the next two or three years. Uh, I mentioned the CAF units. Uh, we've also got CAF vehicles that are being deployed for Transpennine uh, alongside the Hitachi IEP, um, uh, the, the Class 800 platform. And that's great because we're getting trains that hopefully conform to the, the old specs, the, the, the TIS and the new requirements that, that force them to be more track friendly. So hopefully we will start to see some of the wear patterns in track uh, and uh, infrastructure change and, and reduce in some cases. However, we've got more trains than we had before. We have got uh, longer trains, we've got more axles, so the trains that are replacing the Class 185s that Paul's been doing his work on are all five coaches in length, as opposed to three. Uh, so that's a 60% increase in terms of, of axles and, and pretty much gross tonnage. Um, if you look at the train operations that have been happening between um, Staley Bridge and Dayton on the, the TP core, 
say 20 years ago, that might have been two or three trains an hour and it was three coaches. We're now up to six or seven trains an hour with five coaches. Well, when the planets align and TPE can find the drivers, that is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that, 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 that's a huge increase in gross tonnage just from passenger services alone. And I, I suppose we haven't really found the full consequences of that yet. Um, of course, with, with the uh, TRU, we're proposing eight car sets, at eight or nine trains per hour. So again, the, the, the frequency, the extension of, of those trains means that we're going to see a lot more tonnage uh, over those rails. And, and, and you know, we were in a period of discovery here. Over the next few years, we might be finding some hidden wear mechanisms that we haven't really considered before. You know, we knew about RCF before the year 2000, we knew about it before Hatfield, but we didn't know enough about it to prevent the RCF happening in the way that it did. Um, and, and we got cleverer about it afterwards. There may be something else, I hope not, but there may be something else that comes out and bites us from different characteristics of, of rolling stock as they become deployed in greater numbers on our rails. So it's, as I say, it's a voyage of discovery. We don't know where the tonnage increase will end, um, not yet anyway, so uh, again, we, we, we're yet to find out the full impact of what we're trying to get our Victorian railway to do. Uh, and there's other things coming down the pike as well. Um, everybody's talking about decarbonisation. I wish that somebody would really put it all together and join the dots, but hopefully that will happen in time. Uh, Stephen Hart, one of your Network Rail colleagues, is doing a grand job trying to put a network decarbonisation strategy together. Um, but, but we really need this to be adopted at a higher level. We, we, we need it to be borished, really, um, unfortunately. Um, but... In one way or another, the trains of the future will either be fully electrified, um, because in some cases for high speed and for freight, we just can't get enough electrons out of batteries or fuel cells. It just isn't possible. And if a civil servant tells you it is possible, please correct them. Um, there will be cases where batteries are, are the option, um, so particularly for short off-wire excursions. Uh, so we'll see more battery hybrids being procured. Um, I think Windermere will be uh, a battery uh, solution ultimately. I think it's a, a hybrid diesel uh, going in there uh, for now, but I, I'm pretty sure that that will end up being a battery solution. Um, hydrogen will make its place on the more sort of slower, longer regional routes that haven't got very much electrification. But for any of those solutions that aren't pure EMU or uh, electric locos, you've got a mass implication. You need a lot of batteries to get something somewhere um, for, for more than 60 miles off wire. Uh, for fuel cells, they're even heavier again because actually you need a battery bank to, to share the load and to give you a good amount of boost in traction because fuel cells are great in terms of their efficiency, but in terms of actual juice that it pushes out, um, that they've got quite a low energy density. Um, so because we're not electrifying at the 300 STKs that we need per year to actually get the whole thing done by 2050, um, we, we need to account for the fact that the mass of trains will go up again because we're just going to have more equipment on the train to, to push the, uh, the train into areas uh, where we haven't got the wires. And I think that that needs to be balanced very carefully against decisions like um, discontinuous electrification, as a for instance. Um, you know, for that 30 metres that you can't wire because the tunnel's too low, you're going to stick 10 tonnes of battery on a three-car EMU. The, the, the cost implications of that over a 30-year life cycle need to be weighed up very, very carefully before we, we try to start to take shortcuts with, our, with the electrified infrastructure. Um, we don't know how it's all going to be procured because uh, Keith Williams hasn't um, uh, been allowed to publish his report yet. Uh, the report is imminent. It's been imminent for the last six months. Um, uh, and when it does come into play, we understand that there may be primary legislation that's needed to enact some of the changes that he's going to be talking about. So um, the, the ultimately... The, the betting money is that we won't have franchises anymore, we'll have something that looks like management contracts, but that may mean that, that procurement becomes centralised rather than allowing train operators to do that, uh, as the, some of the, the larger rolling stock procurements have already been done. Um, I'm told that if you're looking into the future and you're talking about trains, you have to mention Maglev and Hyperloop, so therefore I've mentioned it. Um, uh, and... To sort of leave on a more comforting note, uh, we live in, in quite febrile times, uh, both politically, socially, and in terms of the railway. You know, there's a lot of change going on, a lot of uncertainty. Um, but to any of those of you who, who may be Wittertainment fans out there, Mark Kermode, Simon Mayo, anybody listen to that podcast at all? 
getting a couple of nods. Uh, I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite quotes, which is from Professor Mark Kermode, um, that uh, it'll be all right in the end, and if it's not all right, it's not the end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.